We have to learn to hear truth from black and brown bodies. And if we're willing to do that, then we will have made some progress. So I'm here to do what I came to do, but I just want you to know the importance of listening to the source of wisdom. Just like those of us who were men, we can talk about sexism and we should. Right? We know that in fact, most of us grew up in communities and went to schools K through 12 in which we learned very little about anything that was not a Eurocentric frame of history and literature and the past. We learned the past that made us feel good and not the part that might bring us up a little short. But it's important to understand history in all of its complexity, to make sense of our present, we must do that. That's not true just for societies, it's true for individuals, right? I mean, if we really wanna understand our own damage once we become adults, we better get clear on the damage passed down to us in our own families, we know that. Every one of us comes from a dysfunctional home, whether we wanna admit it or not. And when I say we, now I mean those of us called white, we, say these things to people of color like, you need to get over the past. You need to stop paying so much attention to the past. You need to move on from the past. Don't get stuck in the past. It's time to move on. This, I would suggest, is precious. Coming from white Americans who love the past more than anything on earth. Because my people love the past. We love it so much that some of us decided a few years ago to dress up in revolutionary war costumes with powdered wigs and muskets and perhaps even wooden teeth and go to rallies called tea party rallies, which, pardon the expression, is some old ass stuff. <laughs> of course all lives matter, nobody said otherwise. But you don't have to proclaim that which is taken for granted, you have to proclaim that which is ignored, you see. See, when white people say all, we never meant it. Black people know that. Brown people know that. Most white people never had to really learn that. So we said all men are created equal and we didn't mean that shit. You see, we said it, but we didn't mean it. We said it and we wrote black people and brown folks out of all. So when black people of color hear when black and brown folks hear all lives matter, what they hear is the same thing they heard with all men are created equal, that it was a setup, that it was a lie that didn't include them. So if you wanna actually make it clear that all lives matter, A, you gotta act like all lives matter, and you gotta really treat people like all lives matter, and B, you have to proclaim that the lives that you denigrated for centuries actually matter, because that is the part that gets left out. You see? So when we say all lives matter, just to put this in perspective, how ridiculous this comeback is, how absurd, how sophomoric, how nonsensical it is for us to respond to Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter. Let's take it back to like 1971 when the title, when the phrase, when the statement on the street was what? Black is beautiful. That was the way that black folks were trying to take back notions of beauty from a fashion industry, from a glamour industry that had basically defined beauty as white, right? And so black folks were saying black is beautiful, reclaiming their own beauty standards and norms. To say all lives matter in response to black lives matter would be like getting in a time machine tonight. Going back to 1971, hearing somebody say black is beautiful and interrupting them so as to let them know, well, we're all beautiful in our own way. Yes, yeah, shut up, we know. <laughs> sort of misses the point. Be like going back to the early 80s, right, when the HIV AIDS crisis hit. And in those first few years of the HIV AIDS crisis, remember, we had a government that did nothing. President Reagan sat by and watched thousands of people die before he even uttered the term. AIDS. He only said something because his buddy Rock Hudson from the movies died of it. And then he decided he would speak on it and begin to cut loose some research funds for it. But for the first couple of years, didn't want to say anything about it, right? And there were activist groups out in the street, right? ACT UP, Gay Men's Health Crisis, others out in the street demanding funding for AIDS research and what they were in effect saying, even though they didn't use the term and even though we didn't have hashtags in those days, right? Ultimately what they were saying was, people with AIDS lives matter. So to say all lives matter in response to black lives matter would be like going back to one of those rallies in 1982, 1983, interrupting the rally for AIDS funding to remind everyone that, well, people die of pancreatic cancer too. Yes sweetheart and totally irrelevant to the current situation. You have to demand recognition of the thing that gets swept under the rug. That's black life, that's brown life, that's people of color, you see, because we are a country built on the premise that black lives didn't matter. 
And I know we don't want to hear that, but that's just truth. So, hello guys. I hope you're doing fine where you are. Uh, if you're not doing fine, please try and do fine. Yeah. And today I have a guest, a guest with me, um, Mr. Evans, right? Yeah. So, Mr. Evans, kindly introduce yourself, brother. Um, what's up, fam? My name is Evans Friola. I'm a YouTuber just like um, Evans from Kenya. And um, we're both from Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are Evans and we are from Kenya. <laughs> yeah, even squared. Yeah, even squared. Yeah, okay, okay. So today we want to talk about uh, the state of black people, the state of African Americans, or rather African diaspora, uh, who are living outside Africa and um, how they are being treated. Uh, today's video, um, which we are going to borrow from, uh, is, was done by Tim Wise. Tim Wise is, uh, has been an activist for a quite long time now, brother. Do you know of Tim Wise? I, what I know about him is that um, he advocates um, for gender, no, not really gender, <laughs> but um, race equality. Yes, yes. For people to be equal. Yes. Um, he, he pushes for people not to be discriminated yes, based yes. on their race. And uh, he's actually black. He advocates for black, not just any other person. And do you know that Tim Wise has a Jewish ancestry? Oh. Yeah. Yes, he has a Jewish ancestry. And so, in this particular video, he's talking about how black people are being treated in the USA. Uh, particularly, you know, the USA is the largest, uh, the, I think it's the thirdest country, the third largest country in the world uh, after China, yeah. after India, yeah, and then we have the USA. USA. Yes. The USA is the side of almost half of the the equator of Africa. If you divide Africa by two, the U.S. is equivalent to that big head of Africa. Sure. So the U.S. is such a big country. And being a big country, it has almost, is it 70 or 54 states? Not sure of the number of states. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. But it has quite a number of states, yeah. you know. And so what's happening is, uh, being that USA was a newly discovered land and they acquired independence in 1775 from the British. Yes, uh, they acquired independence from the British in 1775, you know. And so following the acquiring of independence, we saw an influx of very many people moving into USA, including the Germans. We had the African Americans, we had the Mexicans, so many people. But the original inhabitants of USA have been the Red Indians. Yes, they are the original inhabitants. inhabitants. And now we have the Red Indians. We have the white people from different parts of Europe. We have the people with African ancestry, people who went there through slavery, you sure. know? So USA has been built on different uh, platforms of, uh, of um, uh, race. Different races have contributed to what to the USA we have today. And we can't conclude that USA was built by one race, no. Sure. It's a collective of all these races. We also have Chinese. Yes. <laughs> so the USA has um, a lot of people from all parts of the world because yeah. Africa, China, you say them, Europe. Yes. They're all represented in the USA. Yes. So... I, I would say that it does not have an honor. Yes. That um, you feel like we are the one who started the U.S. No, 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 no. no, no. Uh, it's, it's a land of the people. Yes. According to your sentiment. Not just according to mine. It's, it's a fact. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tim Weiss is explaining that the people or the, rather the government of the United States is prioritizing one race over the others. But because we've seen the history of the U.S., I don't think it's fair for it to prioritize one race over the others. And this race that they are prioritizing is the white race. And everyone is suffering who is not being prioritized. We, had, we have the non-whites are, yeah. uh, are facing what? Condemnation. And now, without further ado, I want us to watch this video and then we'll give our feedback by the end of the video well, we'll also have a further analysis. Are you ready? I'm sh uh, let's do it. Right. Born ready, bro. We're built on a society that said that black lives didn't matter except in so far as they could provide cheap labor to enrich white people. 
That was how black folks were viewed as cheap labor, expendable labor. I should also point out it is how indigenous people were viewed as people who could be expendable and committed genocide against without hesitation. It was also the way that many Asian Americans were viewed when they were brought here from places like China to work on the transcontinental railroad, worked to death, didn't care if they died or not. It's the way that Latino folks were viewed when in the 1930s we expelled tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands actually, of Mexican Americans who were citizens of this country and we sent them back to Mexico in spite of their citizenship to free up jobs for white men. You didn't learn that in high school history. Maybe you ought to ask your history teacher why. Because it's not contestable, it's not arguable, it's not like there's a rebuttal to what I just said. That happened but we didn't learn about it because black and brown lives historically have not mattered except in so far as they serve the interest of the dominant group. Now we can either deal with that and be honest about it or we can keep running from it and acting like it didn't happen. But if we don't talk about it, if we don't understand that history, it becomes very difficult, doesn't it, to understand the current moment. You can't understand the movement against police misconduct if you don't understand the history of policing in this country vis-a-vis -vis people of color. See, black and brown folks know this history because it's embedded on their DNA. It's embedded in their family stories. They've had to learn it as a way to stay alive, but those of us called white haven't had to learn any of this. So we don't have to know the fact that modern policing traces back to slave patrols. That's where it comes from. What was the slave patrol? It was the thing that rich white people created to take poor white people and have them control black folks. Those of us who don't come from wealth might want to think about what that trick was. Right? Elites who owned other people telling the rest of us, some of us poor white folks who didn't own anybody, hey, you're still part of the team. You can go control these black people for us. See, that was a trick that rich folks played on poor folks to make poor white folks think that they had more in common with rich white people than they did with black people. Some shit doesn't change. That still happens today. That is still the way that we operate today. And if people don't understand that, it's because they don't understand how that system works. So take it back to like 20 years ago now, right? A little over 20 years ago, the OJ verdict. I know there've been a couple, I mean the first one. <laughs> the first OJ Simpson verdict, right? This verdict when OJ Simpson was accused of, tried for, and ultimately acquitted of double murder in 1995, right? And you remember there was a big divide racially in this country, right? Black folks, about two out of three, said that they agreed with the verdict, the acquittal they believed was, doesn't mean they thought he was innocent, by the way. I talked to a lot of black folks at that time. They were like, oh, I think he did that shit. <laughs> but y'all made the rules, and under the rules that you made about reasonable doubt, I think you did not meet your burden. So you made the rules, you live by the rules. Two-thirds of white folks were like, oh my God. This is the most awful miscarriage of just, I can't believe, how in the world does this happen? This is the, the system was great until like two minutes ago. And then OJ walked and oh God, what the hell's going on in this country? Right? Major racial divide, but listen, you know what? That racial divide made sense, it made perfect sense. I don't think it was because white people were racist and unfeeling and uncaring. Hell, white folks had loved OJ for like 20 years, man. OJ was done with black folks. Black folks were done with OJ. Like OJ had walked, like, I'm just being honest, like OJ was not a black problem. Like OJ had walked away from black people. Like he, he grew up in Hunters Point in San Francisco, went to USC right there in the hood in South Los Angeles and said when he left USC, like he didn't ever want to go back. He never wanted to go. So he started making naked gun movies that like only white people saw and then he was like running through the airports in those Hertz commercials, selling rental cars to white people. Like white folks loved OJ until he did something that reminded them of a stereotype they had about black men. Then it was like, oh, he's black people's problem again, right? But OJ, so, so two thirds of white folks didn't like the verdict. Two thirds of black folks liked the verdict, believed it was just, and that made perfect sense because what happened, if you remember the case, and if you don't, let me just fill you in real quick. One of the reasons that there was any kind of reasonable doubt was because one of the chief investigators who found a disproportionate amount of the blood evidence was revealed to be an overt racist, right? So when black folks hear that, when they hear that there's a cop who found the evidence implicating a black man in the murder of two white people who regularly uses the N-word in an overtly racist way, then somehow, you know, like alarm bells go off in black heads. 
right? And by the same token, white folks don't hear those alarm bells because we're like, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Planting evidence on people. Who does that? That's bizarre. That makes no sense at all. That doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen to us. But it does happen to people of color. There's a long history of that. In fact, not only is there a long history, at the very moment that the O.J. Simpson trial was taking place, 1994, 1995, at that very moment, we come to find out a few years later, if you paid attention to the news out of Los Angeles, that in fact there were dozens of officers in the LAPD who were at that very moment engaged in a pattern of misconduct and abuse and planting evidence on suspects of color to sweeten the deal against them in various prosecutions. It became the Rampart scandal. You can look that up. It was one division of the LAPD. It was happening at the very same time as that trial. So when black folks said, we think evidence might have been planted and white folks said, that's paranoid nonsense. In fact, it wasn't. It was rooted in a reason reality and a recognition that that stuff happens doesn't mean that that's what happened in the OJ case. It doesn't mean that that evidence was planted, but it does mean, it does mean that to wonder if that's possible, given the revelations about Mark Furman, the officer in that case, wasn't paranoid. It wasn't irrational. It was rooted in one's actual experience. And if you haven't had that experience, it's just as logical for you to think it makes no sense. Right? In other words, our attitudes about race come from our experiences with race. So if we don't see something and somebody else does, it's not because we're bad people and they're good people or we're stupid and they're more intelligent. It's just you don't have to think about stuff so you don't. That's what white privilege really is when it comes to race. It's about the privilege of having the ability to be stone cold ignorant to other people's truth. Being oblivious to other people's truth. White privilege is the blue pill from the matrix is what it is. Right? If you ever saw the film The Matrix, and if you haven't, you should go see it, but just the first one, the other two suck. Like, <laughs> the trilogy's awful, but the first one is damn good. Right? Keanu Reeves plays Neo, and Lawrence Fishburne plays Morpheus, and there's this scene early on in the film where Morpheus offers Neo two pills. One is blue, one is red, right? And he says, you can take the blue pill, and the story ends, and you wake up, and you remain oblivious and you don't have to know what's really going on. Just like most people in this society, they don't wanna know what's happening, they don't really wanna know, they'd rather die than know the truth. Or you can take the red pill and I can offer you enlightenment and I can take you down the rabbit hole and I can show you just how far it goes. And Neo takes the red pill and he starts to see, if you've seen the movie, right? Starts to see all the stuff that's going on that he never knew about. That is how identity functions in this country. It's how white identity functions, male identity, straight identity, able-bodied identity, affluent rich folk identity. When you're a member of any dominant group, you have the luxury of being on the blue pill and not having to know the truth, right? If you're the target of a system of oppression, you gotta take the red pill just to figure out what the hell is going on. Just so you don't lose your mind, right? Just so you can make some sense of your world. But if you're the dominant group, you're like on a blue pill IV drip from the day you come out of your mama's womb. Right, you're walking around with this damn IV, you don't even know you got it there. And then people of color are like, hey, you see all this racism? And we're like, no, got the blue pill. I don't see nothing. Men, right, same thing on the blue pill. I know that being men and on the blue pill means some different stuff. In the modern pharmaceutical era, that's pharmaceutical humor. You're welcome. Right. Men don't have to know anything about sexism, patriarchy, rape culture if we don't want to know it. Those of us who are straight or cisgender, we don't have to know about straight supremacy, about homophobia, heterosexism, transphobia. Maybe we do know something, but if so, it's only because we probably listened to someone who was the target and decided to believe them, right? So ultimately, we don't have to, though. We have the luxury of being oblivious, taking the blue pill. So we have to be clear about this because people of color don't have that luxury. So they know what goes on right now with law enforcement. They know. Places like New York City stop and frisk policies, right, that over the course of about a decade stopped, what, hundreds of thousands, a couple million, several million, two and a half million people were stopped by the stop and frisk policies of the NYPD. About 90% of them were people of color, right? And of those who were stopped, less than 5% were even issued a ticket because they hadn't done anything. 
So it's not like they were being stopped for actual criminal activity. They were being stopped on suspicion, and the suspicions were not justified in 95% of the instances. In less than 2% of the stops were drugs found. In less than two-tenths of 1% were weapons found. But that was the rationale they gave. Oh, we're trying to get drugs and weapons off the street, but they weren't finding drugs and weapons. What they were doing was taking black folks' names and putting them in a database so they could keep eyes on them. That's what stop and frisk was, and people of color know it. In this country, we know from the CDC and other sources that drug use and drug dealing is equivalent between white folks, black folks, and Latinos, contrary to popular belief, which says that it's black and brown folks who have and use and sell drugs. It's actually equivalent across racial lines, but we know that people of color five times more often are going to be arrested for drug possession, particularly for weed and incarcerated on a drug-related offense. People of color know that, and they know that law enforcement is who does that. So that's why there's a skepticism toward police. That's why we have to proclaim that black lives matter because everything in the system says they don't, right? They know the data, even if they don't know the data, they know the reality behind the data that young black men are about 21 times more likely to be shot and killed by law enforcement than young white men, right? Two to three times more likely when unarmed and posing no immediate threat. People of color know this whether they've done the research and know the exact numbers or they just know it from their own experience. They know it. They know that young black children like Tamir Rice get shot dead in a public park doing what white boys do in this country every day, play with toy guns. <laughs> white boys play with toy guns every day and they do not get dropped by police because those police view them as 20-year-old men, which is what happened in Cleveland, right? They didn't see him as a 12-year-old. They thought he was 20. Right? Because we have animalized black men and we've made them older than they really are in our imaginations. So this kid's playing with a toy gun, something that white people... And keep in mind, Ohio is an open carry state. Right? So if he really was a 20-year-old male, which is what they thought at the time, he had a right to have a real gun, not a toy gun, a real gun. They had no right to shoot him, no right to come up on him, no right to say boo to him in a state that says you can walk around with weapons. White folks will take their weapons any damn place. We walk into Walmart with our guns. We walk into Chipotle. Seriously, Google that shit. Google, about a year and a half ago, white folks were like, I'm going to take my weapons to Chipotle. It was like some demonstration or something, like just to show we could. We're going to Chipotle with our AR-15s. Why you got to have an assault rifle at Chipotle? but you can't kill salmonella with the bullet. I know they ran out of, I know they ran out of carnitas that time, but damn, they'll get that back. You don't have to shoot them, right? And white folks will walk into Walmart with the weapon, walk into Target with the weapon. Nobody does anything, nobody shoots them. Cops don't roll up. John Crawford, on the other hand, in Ohio, also open carry state, right outside of Dayton, whatever it was, right? picks up a weapon, it was, a, it was an air gun, an air rifle. You're not going to kill anybody with an air rifle. And they sell those at the Target. He picks it up off the shelf or the Walmart, whichever it was. I think it was Walmart, right? He picks it up off the shelf. He's walking around. He's just sort of swinging it. He might be thinking of buying it. He's talking on the phone to his girlfriend, right? Some white dude sees him, freaks out, calls the cops. Oh, black guy walking around with a weapon at the Walmart. Yeah, he calls it in. He's a black guy with an afro. Okay, first of all, it's twists. Let's get our black hair straight, please. Right. I mean, come on, white folks. You can just Google that shit. It's not that hard. Like, there's a difference between twist and an afro. And look, can we try to get it straight without touching black people's hair? Can we do that, too? Can we do that? So you can just, you can just look that up. You don't have to touch it. You don't have to touch it. You don't have to touch it just because you got a black roommate. You've never seen one before. Can you get that wet? Can you swim? That's why they have the internet. <laughs> Look it up, right? So he calls in John Crawford, black dude with an afro. First of all, think about that. First of all, it's the wrong hairstyle. They're gonna get some totally different black dude shot on like aisle four of the Walmart. They're gonna roll up, find the dude with the afro and kill him. 
But no, they found John Crawford. They come in. You can watch the video yourself. They roll up. The guy rolls up, turns the corner, opens fire immediately on John Crawford, who was posing no threat to anybody, drops him. At first, it doesn't kill him. John Crawford, stunned, dazed, probably in shock, gets up off the ground to figure out why is somebody shooting at me, moves into the aisle without the weapon, which is now not really a weapon. Like I said, it's an air rifle, sitting on the ground, and they shoot him again five times and drop him and kill him. No indictments. No indictments. And that officer was, by the way, the only officer in the history of that suburban Dayton Police Department ever to kill someone. He's now killed two. That was his second. Still on the force and not indicted by the district attorney locally. So that is why people of color have to proclaim and why we as white folks should as well that black lives matter. Because as long as the system allows that, what we're saying every day is that they don't. And if you have a system that screams every day that those lives don't matter, it takes those of us who believe otherwise to suggest the opposite. But it's a privilege, isn't it, to be oblivious to history? It is. It's a privilege to be able to be ignorant and still be considered educated. Right? How does that happen? How is it that we can not know these things and still be considered competent? Right? How is it that we can be considered competent to do anything, to teach children, to be a physician, to be a social worker, to be a psychologist, right? to vote and not know these things? Sort of interesting, isn't it? Right? Because there are certain things we are expected to know. Whatever the dominant group thinks we need to know, that's what we have to know. Right? That's why people of color, they have to learn white literature, white theater, white poetry, white art. I know we don't call it that. That's sort of the point. When your stuff is the norm, you don't have to ever qualify it. You don't have to talk about where it came from. You don't have to call it white literature. It's just literature. <laughs> Theater. And poetry. And art. Right? People of color have to know all that stuff that white folks decided was important. We as white folks don't have to know anything we don't want to know. And we can still be deemed competent. We can still be deemed intelligent. We can still get a high school diploma. We can still get a college degree, a master's degree, a law degree, a PhD. We can get any professional license for any job we want. We can go into black neighborhoods and teach black children knowing nothing about them, their families, or their communities. <laughs> Thinking that because we got five weeks of training with Teach for America, that we know what the hell we're talking about. Never been up in their space, never actually know anything about them, but just show up because we care. See, that's not how the real world works. That ignorance should mark us as incompetent, but it doesn't. And it's not just with regard to policing, it's with regard to a lot of other things, right? So I was thinking about this recently, about a year and a half ago, um, I was driving our daughters. I, have two daughters. My wife and I have two daughters. They're 14 and 12 now. But about a year and a half ago, when they were 12 and a half and 10 and a half, I was driving them from school to dance. They're dancers. And at the time, they were dancing at the same studio, which was downtown, about, I don't know, eight, 10 minutes away from their school. And so I picked them up, and I'm driving the distance between the school and the studio. And at one point, you have to go through a public housing development to get to the studio, right? So we're at the stoplight waiting for it to turn green, surrounded by public housing on both sides. And the 10 and a half year old, whose name is Rachel, uh, takes this opportunity to ask me a question. She says, Daddy, why is it that pretty much everybody in this neighborhood is black, right? Which is a really damn good question. Like that is an excellent observation on her part. It's a very interesting sociological inquiry and anthropological inquiry. And my guess is that that wasn't the first day she'd noticed that the neighborhood was pretty much all black. It was just the first day she decided to ask, right? I'm sure she had noticed it. We've been driving that route for a year, year and a half at that point. So I'm sure that she had noticed it, but on that day, she decided to ask, and she probably asked because she figured daddy might know because daddy talks about these things, so maybe you'll have the answer. Like if I was an accountant, she wouldn't have asked me. She would have just been like, how do I do my taxes? And I would have been like, online, I don't know, you know? But so she asked the question. Now, here's the thing. She asked me, why is pretty much everyone in this neighborhood black? And of course, her sister, who's 12 and a half, wanting to show up her younger sister and impress her father, naturally decided to intervene with the wisdom that she had apparently obtained somewhere, don't know where. So the 12 and a half year old jumps in and says, redlining. And this is strangely accurate. And for those of you who don't know what redlining means, because I know not everybody does, I will explain. Redlining is, in fact, 
Part of the answer to the question that her sister asked, redlining was a practice that was very formal for generations, right, where banks would basically draw on a map in their office red lines around black neighborhoods. And essentially anybody that lived within the boundaries of that neighborhood, didn't matter what their personal credit history was, didn't matter what their income was, didn't matter what their occupational status was, didn't matter who they were. All that mattered was you live in this neighborhood, you ain't getting a loan. Right? And that's how black and brown communities were starved of wealth and starved of resources. And so when the 12 and a half year old butts in and says, redlining, she's not wrong, although it was weird. And the 10 and a half year old, the 10 and a half year old then says, yeah, I don't know what that means. And I said, yeah, neither does your sister. She's just <laughs> showing off. She probably heard me say that at some point, and she was partially right. So then I proceeded to spend the next two and a half or three minutes sort of giving her a real brief history lesson, right, about the way that certain people were allowed to live in various neighborhoods and other people were not. Public housing, as it turns out, was created in the 1930s for poor white people, right? Black folks weren't even allowed in public housing in most cases. Poor Latino folks, they weren't allowed in public housing. It was set up for poor white folks. But roughly at the same time, the government also started to do some other things, which very quickly allowed white folks to move out of public housing, right? So we created the FHA loan program, the VA loan program, the GI Bill later on, maybe 10, 15 years later. And that allowed white folks almost exclusively to hustle it out to the suburbs where only we were allowed to live keeping those who weren't allowed to live there in the cities. Now you had white folks able to leave for greener pastures, black folks still trapped in urban areas in public housing. It wasn't an accident. It was the result of deliberate decisions to prefer white people and to give us a leg up and to denigrate black people because again, historically, systemically, black lives did not matter. Right? And so I tell my daughter this, and it's like a three minute lesson. It's not like a big, huge discourse. You know, it's, three minutes and she's like, oh, okay, now, you know, now I understand. But the important thing I want you to understand about that story is what if I don't know the answer? And I would gather that a lot of families don't, particularly a lot of white parents wouldn't know the answer to that question. Again, this is what I do, so I know the answer. Right? But a lot of folks wouldn't know because they were never taught. So I actually asked a group of parents about two weeks later, what would you have said if your kid had asked that? And they were all like, I, I don't know. I don't know that I knew the answer and maybe I would have changed the subject. See, there's a problem, right? Because if we don't know the answer and our children are thinking that, and not just the white kids, by the way, kids of color too, we're starting to wonder why is this neighborhood all black and brown? Why is this poor neighborhood in particular all black and brown? If I'm a black kid, I'm wondering that. If I'm a white kid, I'm wondering that. And you know what? If I don't know the answer, do you think my child isn't going to fill in the blanks herself? Oh no, she's going to fill in the blanks. And do you know what she's going to fill in the blank with? She's going to fill it in with the default position of this culture. What do you think the default position is in this society? What is our creation myth? What is our secular gospel? You know it as well as I. Everybody raised here or who was born and has lived here for any particular amount of time knows the answer. The secular gospel is what? That idea that, well, wherever you end up in life, it's all about you. You can make it if you just try hard enough, right? That notion of rugged individualism and meritocracy, right? which history proves is a lie. But if I don't know history, my kid defaults to that because that's what she's hearing. She's hearing that wherever you end up, it's all about you. So if you made it out of the hood, it's because you must have had a better work ethic or better DNA or whatever, you know, a stronger family. And if you're still trapped there, there's something wrong with you. Obviously, you're you know, inferior in some way, culturally, biologically, in terms of family structure. That's the default position. The fact that it's not true doesn't matter. The fact that we all know it's more complicated than that. We all know people, don't we, who worked hard their whole life, have nothing to show for it. We also know people who were born on third base, think they hit a triple, and haven't actually had to work hard at all in their lives. We all know that it's more complicated, but children don't know how to process that. So if they ask that question and we don't know the history, they're going to assume the reason these people are over here and we're all over here is because we're better and they're worse. So in other words, you see the pernicious element of this, racism gets reinforced just by the normal workings of the society. It doesn't require anyone to actually sit you down and teach you racism. It doesn't require someone to sit you down and say these people are better and these people are inferior. All you have to do is just look around, see the inequality and have no answer for why. And the only answer you're given is the one that rationalizes it, rugged individualism. Just as a side note, there is no such thing as a rugged individual. Right. In fact, I would argue there's no such thing as an individual. What the hell is an individual? Human beings have always lived in a social context. 
right? If you ever meet someone who's really a rugged individual, you need to run from that person. Because seriously, that person would be dangerous as hell. They would be like a feral dog, right? A rugged individual would be somebody who was raised on an island by a porpoise, right? They would have no language. They would just try to eat you because they wouldn't even know that that was wrong, like, right? Like, we're all social beings. So the idea that I did everything on my own, nobody did anything on their own, right? Nobody did anything. If I had been born and then just, like, left out on my own... You think I'd be giving this talk? I wouldn't be giving any talk. I wouldn't know how to talk. I would just grunt, right? (laughs) Nobody did anything on their own. There's no self-made millionaires. There's no self-made billionaires. Certainly somebody that inherited $200 million from his daddy and wants to be president is not a self-made anything. So, brother, we've just watched it. Uh, I want to give you this opportunity can you um, give us an analysis from your own perspective? Sure. Mm. <clears throat> um, first thing that I'd like to say is that um, I respect um, Tim Wise yeah, yeah. so, so much because it's rare for the white folks mm. to come and um, defend black folks in the USA yes. because many of these people um, brought up hating black mm. people, being told that there's nothing good that Mm. can come from black and colored people in the USA, Mm. you know? So seeing a grown-up who's white Mm. from what I I just saw, um, Mm. speaking about um, black people passionately, Mm. just that, uh, just, it it just brings Mm. a message of hope to me that Mm. um, this disease can change Mm. if more white people can come and educate their families, educate their children, Mm. remove their hatred, that they agree with, mm. you know, the change starts with one person. Yes. And um, seeing this guy do what he's done just um, gives me hope mm. that um, there are white people in mm. the U.S. of A mm. that are passionate about equality, mm-hmm. are passionate um, about the black folks. Mm. Um, there's this thing that um, he said, and um, I really felt so, so bad, mm. that um, when um, we were pushing for the narrative of black lives matter yes they used to say that all lives matter we don't know that all these lives matter but why do you push mm. such a narrative in the timing when now uh, it's clear that um the black folks are discriminated mm. you know it's so bad it, it means that you're fixed in the mind mm. you do not care what's happening with the black people mm. all you care about is for everyone mm. you know if you're pushing that um for the analogy that um all lives matter mm. it means that you too are going through the same issues that the black folks are going through (laughs) and you're not it's so wrong for Mm. you to push for your own self when you clearly know that um it's an opposite um color that Mm. is being discriminated Mm. that is so wrong and Mm. unacceptable Mm. he also mentioned that our white kids can easily walk with uh toys Mm. and um do their stuff publicly Mm -hmm. but if a black kid does Mm. the same thing Mm. they can easily get killed Mm. he says black people in the usa have have a chance like 20 times to Mm. be shot dead Mm. than a white person Mm -hmm. you know Mm. that just saddens me as a black man um even here in africa Mm -hmm. it gives me you know in africa in africa we really push for green cards and um, Mm i'm finding opportunities in the u.s Mm -hmm. and um when i see such talks Mm -hmm. i just want to stay back and relax (laughs) in the motherland because i fear for myself yes probably uh, it's wrong for me to be black in the u.s Mm -hmm. you know and um that also brings um these other things that i noticed Mm -hmm. with the most um people from the u.s mm. i do a lot of content about mm. jamaica yeah I and see. um i noticed most jamaicans, actually you are doing a great work thank you bro yeah. i noticed most jamaicans are angered by black folks in the u.s mm. because they say that these people um feel entitled mm. I, I i i myself i do not support that because i have interacted with um, black folks from the u.s mm. but jamaicans um out of like three of them mm. Um, two will tell you that mm. um, people who are coming from the U.S. are in a way, um, I don't know, mentally tortured. Mm. They're disturbed. They have an issue. They get angry. They're, 
it, it's just so hard to, to, to live in the US. Mm -hmm. So when I hear Jamaicans say that, I now understand according to what this man has mentioned um, in this video, mm -hmm. it's not easy to be a black man mm -hmm. in the USA. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. And um, it takes for the white people to come and talk publicly mm -hmm. and support these people. Mm -hmm. uh, brother, you know, you give an example where you said uh, when you hear of such speech, such as the one that Tim Weiss is trying to give, you are, you are held back. You are, you are saying, no, I don't want to go back to the... Not going back, but I don't want to go there. Yeah. A lot of us would even kill each other to go there. Yeah, because it's, it's a thing in Africa. Each and every year, we all apply for green cards, lottery, for us to secure a space. They live to in, the uh, American dream. They even put their life on the line to go to the US. Yeah. Or the UK in such case. Remember the guy who took a booing? He was on the tires hanging from um, from uh, yeah. Jomo Kenyatta. I've, I've seen, I've seen that. The, I've heard of that story. To Heathrow. To Heathrow, London. He he died along the way. Actually, he died um, before landing. No, he died after reaching Heathrow. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, the the tires have this case. Yes, yes. That they enter. Yes. So he was safe the whole trip. Ah. So at that point where uh, they were ready to land at ah. Heathrow and the tires are off, yes. it was too much for him. Ah. So he fell off at that point before the, the plane actually landed you know, on you the know, ground. This one is so much uh, of a brainwash. I don't know if you've watched the movie The Matrix. Not really. We have Ken Reeves. Keanu Reeves has acted the movie John Wick. You know John yeah, Wick? Yeah, you know John Wick, man. Yeah, he's so wicked. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so in this movie, The Matrix, they try and tell us that we are not living a real life. We are not humans. It's mm. as if you and me here, we, don't, we do not exist. We are just like apps on a phone. So think of an emoji on WhatsApp. <laughs> so we are like emojis on whatsapp sure you can just send an emoji to send a certain message if you are sad you send the cry the sadness yes. emoji so think of it as we are in a we, we are in a computer and somebody is controlling us and uh another person called Lawrence fishbone who is a black person tells the white person he gives him two uh two medicines a blue and a red Pill. pill yeah he tells him the blue pill will make you continue with your sleep continue being lazy not lazy but with the ignorance with the lack of knowledge but take the red pill and you'll wake up from the ignorance you know this one i can liken it with the situations today and a perfect example would be the plato's allegory of, of the cave have you heard of that no <laughs> it's so interesting, brother. So the Plato's allegory of the, uh, of the cave goes this way. Think of somebody, little babies, who were born in a very steep cave. Do you know any cave here in Kenya? Uh, the Mau Mau ones. I saw, I saw some at um, the Mount... Um, the this mountain went? Where I went, went? Um, the other day. Okay, yeah. say, say a baby was born there and the parent died and left them there. Let's say 20 babies were born there. They've never seen anything else. And they grew up till they reached 50 years inside the cave. And inside this cave, we have monsters. These monsters have put on some light fire inside. So the only things these people have seen is the fire and the monsters and themselves, you know? They know there are 20 and they know the fire and they know the monsters. So these monsters, have puppets, like dolls. You know, if you put an object on light, it will cast its shadow to the places not receiving light. Yeah, sure. And so the shadow is always bigger than the actual object. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these babies, they are not babies now, they're old men, 50 years. They will be aligned this way. And then the, the puppeteer would be placing the puppet and now the flame would be hitting the puppet and casting a very huge shadow on the wall of the cave. Yeah. And now one time they would remove a horse, you see it, a bird, any object. And now it would reach a time these people only knows the puppet 
they know uh, the flame, they know themselves, and they know the images. Mm. And they'll struggle so hard to memorize these false... <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> to memorize these false images. They would even fight each other, mm. and they would compete, and they would say, the person who is able to cram all these, they don't know it's false. To them, yeah. it's true. Mm. They don't even have the concept of false and truth. It's not there. They've been born there up to 50 years. They're still in the cave. Mm. So all they know is the image, you know? So one time comes and one of them breaks from this chain. And he's, he walks and he sees the flame. Ah, this is a flame. So we also have a flame. And he sees the, the puppeteers were not there. They mm. left. They went for some errands. And then he sees the puppets, the objects. Mm. And then he looked at the puppet and he looked at the image. It was so different. So different. The puppet was so small, oh. but it cast a huge shadow on them. That was the reality. That they've been having for all those years. 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> so he walks outside. He sees a very big f round fire. That was the sun. He sees trees. He sees rabbits. He sees all these. He says, ha? Huh? He sees life for he the first time. He sees life for the life. In fact, when he left the cave, his eyes were hurting. You know, when too you... Too much light. Too much light. But with time, he had adjusted. And he went and walked, drank some water, some colorless water. He could see himself in the water. Say, hey, this is how I look. <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> and then he went back to the cave. He told them, no, we guys, you guys, you are living false. This is not the reality. The reality that is there is not this. Reality which is there is outside, not what we have here. Mm. Now what follows? These people said, no. How dare you tell us such, something like this? I am the king. I have crammed all these images. Why do you want to dispel all my, my ranks and do all this? Next time you try and leave, I will kill you. <laughs> 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 this, this is what he says. And he decided to go, and he left them. You know, he came back to spread our enlightenment. Yeah, the message. The message. Now, Plato's allegory of the cave is about illusions, and it's about enlightenment. Tim Weiss is giving some very, very impactful message to the black people, to the brown people as well. Mm. It's, he's telling them the reality. Many people do not believe. Many people are fighting to go to the USA, fighting to do this and this, but they don't know the real deal outside. Mm. Africa has a lot of potential that we can get from it. We don't need to go there. We can stay here. We can do our videos. We can talk. God, where he is, he sees we are working hard. He can make sure we, we don't go hungry. You understand? And now, Plato's allegory of the cave is true. It's like what Tim Wise is saying right now. And I love how he gave examples of the blue pill yeah. and how some... How <laughs> you know the funny part was when he said the blue pill, uh, and he tried to clear off the ambiguity where he said, No, I'm not referring to that blue pill. You know, sometimes some words have been sexualized, yeah, sure. So, words have been sexualized, and all this is just part of the dimension of, of falsehood, the dimension of feeding ourselves with what the society wants us to grasp, yeah, yes. But I'm thinking that black people, if it's important, if it's capable, it's important, yes. But if it's capable for you, you should, sh you should try and move to Africa, uh, see Africa for yourself. We've seen a number of people move to Africa. Sure. We personally know of an African-American who lives in here in Kenya, right? Yeah, a lot of them, not a even one. A lot of them. And b they are telling the same story. They are like one of those people who left the cave. You know, you don't need to go back to the cave. Just go back and tell them, but don't stay there. Yes, lest you be chained again. That that message is powerful, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's powerful. <laughs> it's called Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Yes. Learns a, learns a new concept. Yes, yeah. yes. So, guys, uh, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Our message here with Evans uh, Rayola is to help you get enlightened. And guys, kindly, 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 from the bottom of my heart, kindly go and check my brother's channel, uh, Evans uh, Rayola. He does really good content, content about Africa. 
uh, really nice work on YouTube, Evans Rayola. A link this time. A link is link in the description. Sure, thanks. I sure. normally say and I forget many times. <laughs> I'll, I'll remind you. Okay, I'll okay. Remind you. Mm. Now tell us about what you do before we sum up. Um, so basically, what I do um, is talk about um, um, black stories. It could be in Africa, it could be outside of Africa, and um, it, le- let me say in Africa and um, in the diaspora. That's what um, my brand does, and I push for the analogy of um, black folks to come back to the motherland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, thank you for watching this video, and see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye. 2,400 years ago, one of history's most famous thinkers said life is like being chained up in a cave, forced to watch shadows flitting across a stone wall. Pretty cheery, right? That's actually what Plato suggested in his Allegory of the Cave.